we see things a certain way. Over time, we begin to accept these things. It's the status quo. It's the way they're always going to be. It is what it is. Until it isn't. Something happens. Something big. A change. A total transformation. Join us to dive into what it means to come into contact with the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Because now, nothing can ever be the same. This changes everything. Good evening, everybody. Hope you guys are doing well tonight. Hope you guys have had a great week so far. Well, tonight we begin our third session of D Now. This changes everything. And so as we start tonight, let's begin by singing of God's amazing grace. Let's sing this together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Sing it out. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.
that you've done for me. continue singing of the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give have paid my ransom. 
What amazing grace. Think about that. We just talked about this this last week. How much does our Father love us that he sent his one and only Son to die on the cross for us? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is love. That is grace. And that's everything that we're talking about in our parable. Think about last week. Last week, we talked about how the father let the younger son go. When the younger son was completely disrespectful, and he was saying, I want you to die so I can have everything that is coming to me, the father didn't slap him. The father didn't ground him. The father didn't kick him out of the house. The father let him go. He let him go off knowing that it was going to end up wrong. Knowing that it was going to hurt his own heart. But knowing that that's probably what he needs to do to help his son go on the journey that he needs to go on. Second, we talked about how the father ran to the younger son when everything fell apart for the son and he had to come back. And he was coming back of, at least I can come back as a slave because my father's slaves have it so much better than what I'm doing now of living with pigs and eating out of a pig feed. I can go back and at least be a slave. And the father, when he sees him coming, he's watching, he's waiting. He's been yearning, waiting for his son to come back. And the father ran to him. As completely undignified as that was, he could not help but running to him and welcoming him back, not as a slave, but as a son, with full rights that come with that. He put the ring on his finger that says, this is my son. He is part of my household. I don't care what he's done in the past to me. I don't care how he's disgraced me. He's coming back to me. And the father celebrated the young son's return. He not only welcomed him back, but he threw a party to end all parties. He killed the fattened calf because this son of his that was dead is now alive. The son that was lost is now found. That is love. How deep the father's love that he had for his son. And we talked about how it's not just a story that's in our Bible. This is a parable. This is what Jesus is using to describe our Heavenly Father and how He loves us. How deeply He loves us that He would sacrifice Himself to come and rescue us. On Sunday in our small groups, in our discussion groups, we talked about how through Jesus' life and death and resurrection, God made it possible to be once and for all set free. So it's not just something we're studying. This is true in our lives. Today we're going to be focusing on the older son in our parable. This is probably my favorite part of this parable. I love this parable. I love studying this parable. I love coming back to it. And the older son is one that I keep coming back to and I truly focus on myself. We're going to talk about why I do that in a little bit. But this lesson today is going to help teach us how we should be living as believers, as followers of God who have been already saved and walking with God. How should we be living our lives today? But before we jump into our story, let's read the full parable in in its whole. So again, we're in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants." And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And he said to him, 
And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us celebrate and eat. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your, fa- your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The first point that we're going to talk about is how the older son was self-righteous. Turning your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Paul is the author of Galatians. Paul, you know Paul, he's a missionary. And he's been sent by God to go out and spread the gospel to the Gentiles, non-Jews. So the gospel is no longer with just the Jews, who Jesus was, and he spent all of his time with. But he's starting to spread throughout all of the world. And one of the first churches that Paul went to was Galatia. And since Paul has left there and he's gone on his missionary journeys, he's continued planting more churches, False prophets have been coming in and they've been saying that all you Gentiles, you need to be like Jews and you need to do this. You need to do that. And word is getting back to Paul that all these false teachers are starting to add on all these extra rules for these non-Jews to be doing in order for them to be saved, in order for them to be Christians. And so Paul writes to them. And so chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes, We who are Jews by birth, and not sinful Gentiles, know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Paul's making an extremely important point right here, that we are only justified because of what Jesus did. Even the Jews who grew up obeying the law, spent their entire life studying the law so that they can live in right relationship with God. Now as Christians, as because of what Jesus did on the cross, they now know that the law is not meant to save them. It is meant to point them to God. And so if it's not meant to save the Jewish people that are now Christians, and they are not saved through that, but they're saved by the life and death of Jesus Christ on the cross, and his resurrection over the dead. If that's what saves the Jews, why is it any different than the Gentiles? They don't have to become Jews first to become Christians. All they have to do is turn to Christ. Because justified means they are counted and declared righteous. There's nothing they had to do to become righteous. There's nothing they had to do to become right with God because Christ has already done it. Think about our parable. Who is, Paul, who is Jesus talking to when he's telling this parable? Remember, this is the third of three parables. So look at the first two verses of Luke chapter 15. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners, that's the first group, were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So you remember, there's two groups that we're talking about. Jesus is teaching, and this group of tax collectors who are Jews that have completely turned on their own people and are robbing their brothers and their sisters They're robbing their neighbors to be able to serve Rome so that they can make more money. They completely turned on their own people and started giving allegiance to other people 
other people than God's people. So other Jews, they hate tax collectors. They hate them because they are the worst of people because they've turned on God's own people. And then they just say sinners. This is all the scum that the people don't want to associate with. So think about if you were in church and you notice somebody walking in and you go, what are they doing here? That's who is coming around Jesus as he's teaching. And the other people that are gathered around other than the tax collectors and the sinners are the Pharisees and the teachers or the scribes. These are people that have devoted their entire lives to the law, to the Old Testament, to what Moses wrote about in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. All 700 commandments that God has given them and that they have added to themselves. And if they keep them better than anybody else, that makes them better than anybody else. And so they hold themselves at a higher standard. They look down. They, in this very story, right as Jesus is trying to teach them, they look down on the tax collectors and sinners. They say he even spends time with them and eats lunch and dinner with them. How much of a disgrace is Jesus that he would even associate with these people? They think they're better than everybody else. So Jesus is telling the parable directly to these people. Directly, it is aimed directly at the Pharisees and the scribes. John Piper, a very popular preacher, one of the best preachers that is out there, he once said about this parable, this is a passage for people who tend to think of other people who need this passage. So what he's saying is, if you, when you read this parable, when you read about the lost son, if your mind immediately goes to so-and-so needs to hear this, it's not them, it's you that needs to hear this. If your mind immediately goes to, I'm definitely not like that younger son, and I'm definitely not like the older son who's just so haughty on himself, that's so-and-so. No, this parable's for you. Skim down to verse 25. This is where the story turns away from the son and the father and it comes back to the older son. The younger son has now returned home. He was gone away for who knows how long, but it had to be several years. And he comes back home. And there's a party going on. And the older son has been working in the field all day long. He's been sweating. He's been striving. He's been doing everything that his dad said. Everything that is required. And he starts hearing that there's dancing going on. And he starts finding out that there's a party. So he asks somebody, what's going on? And they tell him that his younger son is back. And so his dad has killed the fattened calf. This is his own brother. The boy that he grew up with, that he wrestled around with, that he played jokes on, that he tattled to his dad on when they, his dad was upset with them. This is his own brother. Somebody he should be loving who has gone away who is most likely that they've thought dead. But he's back. He should be celebrating that his brother's back. And what does he do instead? The Bible says he refused to go in. He said, no, I don't want any of it. And so word finally gets back to his father. And so I don't know if the father had been keeping lookout. So when's he coming back in from the field? When's his work done? Because he needs to be here and to celebrate what's going on in our family. The way that the father has brought in the younger son, you know that he cares about his family. He wants that relationship. He longs for that, that intimacy between his sons. So I don't know if he's been watching and waiting and he sees his son up there. I don't know if one of the servants goes to him and says, he's not coming down. But what does the father do when he finally finds out that his, his older son is not coming down? The Bible says that he came out to him and he entreated him. He begged him, please come in. In the same way that the father went out to the younger son and, be, and welcomed him in, he ran to him, abandoning every ounce of pride that he had, every smidget of dignity that he had. That didn't matter anymore. His son was home. And now that his older son is doing something very similar and he's getting his own self-pride, his own self-righteousness in the way of everything, he runs out to him and he pleads with him, groveling, son, please come in. Your brother that we thought was dead is home. He's alive. 
Look at what the older son says. But he answered to his father, look, all these years I've been slaving away for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. This younger son, this older son, he needs to hear what Paul was writing about in Galatians, right? He needs to know that it's not about what you do that saves you. It's not about what you do that earns that relationship with the father. The father already has that relationship with you. He's already reached out and he's already given it to you. He needs to know it's not about what he's done or not done. He needs to know that his own pride is getting in the way. It's not the older son's wrongdoings that's keeping him from the, pro- from the, pro- from the party. It's not the sinfulness that is keeping him away from celebrating. It's his own pride. He's keeping himself away from a celebration that the father's throwing for somebody that has been dead and is now alive. It's his own pride. It's his own self-righteousness that's keeping him separated from the relationship that's going on. He's doing it to himself. Just like we did when we looked at the younger son's this, the, um, the younger son's disjustice, the, the, the shamefulness that he did to his father. Let's look at what's going on in the cultural context for this older son as well. The older son is disrespecting his father in the same way that the younger son did. He may not be saying, I wish you were dead, but he's still disrespecting him, right? In like modern times, we, we see this on a regular basis. We see children disrespecting their parents. We see children, parents telling their children to do stuff and the children not doing it. We see parents saying, don't go out and do this. And the children saying, I don't really care what you say. I'm going and doing what I want. That's common for us to see on TV. That's common for us to see in this community. But in Bible times, that's insane. The father should disown his older son for what he's saying. He should kick him out and disown him and say, you have nothing now. Just in the same way that he should be doing that for the younger son, But in the same way that the father loved the younger son still, the father loves the older son still too. The father comes for him and begs for him to change his mind. Come in. Come join what's going on. Come be in relationship with what we've got going on. Don't let yourself get in the way. Tim Keller once said, Religion operates on the principle of I obey Therefore, I'm accepted by God. The basic operating principle for the gospel, however, is I'm accepted by God through the work of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I obey. All religions operate on a merit-based system where you do good, that means you're holy. But that's not the way that we act as Christians. It's the exact opposite. God makes us holy and loved. Therefore, we do good. That's the main thing that we're looking at today. And we're going to keep coming back to this point over and over again. God loves us no matter what we do. We can't make him love us anymore. No matter how hard the older son worked, no matter how hard he fought to make sure he obeyed every rule his dad gave him, it does not change how his father loves him. His father's going to love him no matter what even when he disrespects him. And he says, I'm not going in there because of what you've done. I'm not going in there because you've loved my younger son when he slapped you in the face and took all of our money and left and took it to a foreign country and squandered it. The father still loves him despite his disjustice, despite his arrogance, despite his self-righteousness. Our second point is that the older son was a slave. Turn to Romans 8, 14. In my translation, I've, I'm, I've been reading off of two translations of our parable. One translation says, that the younger son says, I was slaving away. I was keeping your orders. Another translation says, I've kept your commands and I have served you. These are not things that you say to your father, right? These are things that a slave says to a master. These are things that a servant says to their ruler. He's not in a relationship with his father. He is acting as a hired hand. I have done this, so you should give me this. 
I have done this. You failed in this re- transaction because you didn't even give me this. Jesus is using these words to denote slave, slavery, to denote servanthood very purposely. He wants us to see that there is a big gap in what the Father wants and what the Son is actually trying to do. So let's read in Romans chapter 8 of what Paul says about this. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought you about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and accept what he did on the cross as the fulfillment of our sins, as the, the substitutionary just covering of all the wrongdoing that we've done, we are no longer slaves. We are sons and daughters with God. In the Old Testament, the Jews, they could not even write Jesus, God's name down. They had to leave out letters when they wrote the name of God. They couldn't even speak God's name. That's where we get the word Yahweh. Yahweh is not God's name. Yahweh is a title. It means Lord, Adonai. Those are titles for God. We don't actually even know God's name that he gave to his people because they were in so awe of God, in so awe of his holiness that they couldn't even say or write his name. But what does Paul say? Paul says that we get to cry because of the Spirit dwelling within us. We get to cry, Abba, Father. Do you know what Abba literally means? It's not just Father. Because when we think of Father, we think Father is a very formal way. I don't walk around with my dad and call him Father. That's too formal. I have a personal relationship with my dad. That's why I call him Dad. My kids, when they talk to me, they call me dad. They call me daddy. That's what Abba is. It's the personal link. It's an affectionate name for the Father. So when Paul is writing and he's saying that as Christians, we get to cry out to our God as our Father, and we get to call him Abba, he's saying we get to call God daddy. We get to call him Papa. My cousin, that's what he called his dad growing up, was Papa. My, one of my coworkers, her daughter calls her Ma. Those are affectionate names. They have, they have deep-rooted emotion with it. And that's how we get to know our God. Because we are members of his family. The older son didn't serve out of love. He didn't have that relationship with his father. He didn't look at him like that. He looked at him like father. Very formal. You're the boss. I'm your son. You command this. I do this. It is a very transactional relationship. There's no affection with what's going on. Verse 29 in Luke 15 in our parable, it says, I did all these things to serve you, and you've never given me anything in return. Can you imagine the Pharisees? If they were actually hearing what Jesus was saying, they'd understand that he's speaking directly to them. If you are really God's people, if you really love God the way that you say you love God, you would understand that it's not about keeping the law. It's not about I'm better than you because I kept more commandments than you. It's not about you're a tax collector and I study the law, so that makes me better than you. God doesn't love us like that. He loves us out of a personal relationship with us. He loved the Pharisee the same way he loved the tax collector. That's an odd thing to say because we study this passage and we get this stuff and we understand what's going on. We get that the Pharisees messed up. And we get that Jesus loved the tax collectors and they longed for Jesus while the Pharisees looked down on him. So we get that God and Jesus loved the tax collectors. But think about it. God loved the tax collectors and the Pharisees the same. He wanted that same relationship with them. But just like the Pharisees, the older son, he had reduced his life down to a checklist. My father told me to do this, and I did it. 
My father asked me to do this, and I did it. Our estate, the, the plantations that we have, all the livestock that we had, this had to be done, and so I did it so that my father didn't have to, and I could earn this from him. That's not how we should be living our lives. The son, the older son is missing the point. And that's our third point. The older son is missing the point of what's really going on. And he misses it in two ways. First, he believes that he is above sin. He believes that he has done enough, that he is above all that sinfulness that his younger brother has done. He's missing the point that just in the same way that the younger son disobeyed his dad and just in the same way that he disrespected him, that the older son is doing the exact same thing. He thinks, I am not like him. I didn't run off and take your money and wish you were dead and take it off and then squander it in a foreign land and have to live with pigs. I didn't do that, so that makes me better than that. It's easy for us to jump on the bandwagon of the older son. Think about it. He's the one that stayed with his dad. He's the one that held respect to his dad. He's the one that served diligently. He did everything. What more could the father want, right? That's what the Pharisees would have been talking about. When Jesus is getting down to the older son and the older son is making this case, they're going, that's right. But he's missing the point. What, the, what more could the father want is that he wants, the father wants him He wants that relationship. He wants that love. He doesn't care about that you did this and did this and did this. I don't care that my kids disobeyed me time and time and time again. I still love them. When I told them to stop doing something, they continued to do it. That doesn't make me stop loving them. I still love them. The older son's sin is not as easy to see because it's not going off and squandering stuff. It's not an outright, I wish you were dead to the father. Because remember what we, what we talked about sin? Sin isn't just about breaking rules. Anything you do that separates you from Jesus is sin. Anything that places you in the place of Jesus, of overcoming that sin, making yourself as the way to be righteous, that is sin. That's putting yourself in God's, in Jesus' place. That's saying, God, I know you've got a plan, but let me see what I can do first. That's what Adam and Eve did back in the garden. They wanted to be like God, so they ate of the fruit that the serpent told them that their eyes would be open so that they would see things the way that God sees things because they would be more like God. And they completely missed that God had already created them in his image. They were already like God. For the older son, the father was just a stepping stone to get where, what he wanted. Jesus is warning the Pharisees and scribes. He's saying, I'm not just your helper. I'm not just a moral example. So many religions think of Jesus that way. Islam doesn't actually dispute that Jesus was a real person. They just say he was another great prophet. We should study him as somebody that we should model our life after. Jesus is telling the Pharisees and scribes, I'm not a moral example. I'm not a helper to be able to get you to something. I'm your savior. Stop trying to save yourself. I'm already here. He's telling you and me, I've already done it. Quit trying to earn something that's already been paid for. Turn to John chapter 14. Verse 23, this is a conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. And in this conversation, Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, he w- and we will come to him and make our home in him. It's not, if you obey me, then that means you love me. There's a very important cause and effect here. If anyone loves me, he will keep my command. Remember going all the way back to when we first started this lesson, when I said that that order is very important. This is what we're trying to get right today. We love Jesus. We love God. And because we love him, because we have that relationship with him, 
we obey him. We do good things. We don't earn that love. We don't earn that relationship by the things that we do. We do the things that we do. We do the things of glorifying God and serving him and doing what's right because we already have that love with God. We already have that relationship. And Jesus then says that those people who love me, and because they love me, their actions are showing that. That is evident who they are. Jesus then says, those people, we will come and make a home in them. The literal translation is we will come make a dwelling place within them. For so many of us, are like houses or places that we sleep. So we go off to work, we go off to school, we go see other, our friends, we go to church, we go out into the community. We may go to the bowling alley, the movie theater, and then we come back home to sleep. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about where the whole center of your life is there. My kids right now, because of all the coronavirus and everything shut down, their lives are centered around their house. Food comes to them at the house. We don't go out to eat. Entertainment is at the house. We don't go to the movie theaters. We'll rent movies and watch it at the house. We, we got a slip and slide in the front yard. Then we get out and we have fun in the front yard. Everything is centered around that dwelling place. And Jesus is saying that if you love me, then you will keep my commandments. And if you love me, and I will come make my dwelling place within you. I will reside in you and I will dwell within your heart. This is the second and most heartbreaking way that the older son missed the point. He and his father had spent countless hours together. Think about it. All these years growing up, these are probably adult children. They're not just little kids. They're not even teenagers most likely. They were adults. How many times has that older, father, this older son sat down at the dinner table with his father? How many days and days and weeks and weeks and years and years has he gone out into the fields and worked with his father? How many conversations they had sitting out there, watching as the sun set, talking about how, what, how life should be, talking about what needs to get done on the farm, talking about how the younger son is going to the older son is going to take over. How many conversations that they had about the younger son and how he left them and how there's something missing now. He has spent his entire life with his father, working, sharing meals, having conversations, running the entire estate and all the servants that they've got. He was always with the father. Can you hear the father's heartbreak when he says, son, you were always with me and all that is mine is yours. Your younger son has already taken his inheritance and gone off. He doesn't have any right to anything. Everything that I have is yours. My own heart is yours. And you're asking for a young goat so that you could celebrate with your friends because you didn't break any rules? I thought we meant more to each other than that. I thought that you were more than just another servant of mine. I thought you were my son. But the son was so fixated on what he felt he didn't have, on what he saw somebody else having, that he missed it all. That's what tripped up Adam and Eve. They were so fixated on what the serpent convinced them that they didn't have. And they missed everything else that God had given them. He, God told them, you, don't, you can only not eat from this one tree, but everything else is yours. I am literally walking in the garden with you. And the serpent said, well, God doesn't want you to have that because he doesn't want you to be like him. And he got it fixed in their mind of that little thing that they may not have. Even though it's going to take away so much more. The son missed the fellowship. He missed the relationship that he had with his father and was so bent up on what do I not have? I know you know Steve Jobs, right? 
Steve Jobs, founder of Apple. Pure genius, right? He literally has changed the way that we live our lives. Most of you are probably watching this through a creation of Steve Jobs. I've got three items within three feet of me that are from Steve Jobs. He changed the way that we do stuff. He changed the way that we communicate with each other. He changed the way that we do entertainment. He changed the way that we do business in school. He's a technological genius. He was also very secluded away from society. He, he, he did not want people around him. And when he died, he had $6.5 billion to his name. That's incredible. As his life was coming to an end, he, he hired a biographer to come in and talk to him and study him and go through from the very beginning of his life. And so Steve Jobs could tell his entire story. And it could get all recorded down. So when he was gone, it was there. And the biographer, when they were going through, he asked Steve, why are we doing this? And listen to what he said. I wanted my kids to know me. I wasn't always there for them, and I wanted them to know why and to understand what I did. Talk about missing the point. He missed spending time with his kids because of his business, because of everything that he was building, this entire empire. And it was good for society. But he already knows that he has missed out on his relationship with his kids. So he says, I don't want them to misinterpret what's going on or why I did it. So I'm writing this book so that my kids can know me and know why I did what I did. How much better would it have been for his kids to know him because they had relationship with him? Because they spent time playing with him? Because they got out in the yard and they kicked a ball together? Because they went face first into a slipping slide, into a puddle of suds? Because they curled up on the couch and watched a movie on their iPhone. He missed it. Our greatest joy is not what we leave behind. Our greatest joy is the fellowship and relationship we have with our Heavenly Father. Our greatest regret will be if we do like the older son and we miss that relationship because we're so focused on earning something from God. That's why I love this passage. That's why I've studied this parable and I come back to this parable over and over again. That's why when I study this parable, I immediately jump to the older son. I have a relationship with God. I have a personal relationship with Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And so I acknowledge what the younger son, I acknowledge that point. I am grateful for that. I needed that at a point in my life. But now that I'm in full relationship with God, now that he, I'm ex- adopted into his family, I'm a son of God, I get to call God the creator of all the universe, Daddy. I get to call him Abba, Father. I need to constantly remind myself not to be the older son, not to be one of the Pharisees or the scribes, not to miss everything because I'm trying to earn something or I'm trying to do right, but I need to focus on that love that God has for me and I have for him. Because, because if I focus on that relationship, if I focus on that love, just as Jesus said, then I will want to serve him. I will want to do good. And that's my challenge for you this week. Place yourself in the older son's footsteps. Hopefully you are like me. You've already accepted Jesus Christ. If you haven't, Spend time dwelling on that. What do I need to get right in my life to have that relationship with God? If you need to talk to somebody about that, give me a call. Call the church office. Talk to Jonathan. Talk to Pastor Cliff. Talk to your parents. We are all here. Call your Sunday school teachers. Call any of the adults or deacons in this church. We want to talk to you about that. That is the most important thing. But if you've already done that, if you've already taken that step, You need to be placing yourself in the footsteps of the older son. You're coming back in. Are you focused on what you have done for God? Or are you focused on the relationship that you have with God? What are your motivations for having that relationship with God? Is it because you're wanting to earn something? Are you wanting to earn heaven? 
Because if you're trying to earn heaven, you get there, you're going to be really disappointed because it's not going to be focused on the streets of gold. It's not going to be focused on the beautiful glassy sea. It's not going to be focused on the eternity away from the, the fiery hell. Heaven's going to be focused on our Heavenly Father, our God. And if you've missed building on that relationship and growing in that relationship with God so that you can earn something else, you're going to be really disappointed when you get there. Because a relationship is what matters. So spend time this week dwelling on that, dwelling on the relationship you have with God and where are you at in that process. And then let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us to the, as much as you do. To sacrificing your own dignity, to sacrificing your own son, and to come chasing after us. Full on sprint, running to us, embracing us, pleading and begging with us to turn to you. Forgive us of being like the older son and trying to place our footsteps in Jesus's and trying to place ourselves as the rescuer of our lives. Don't let us get so wrapped up in our own self-righteousness. Don't let us get so wrapped up in being a slave to doing what's right. But help us to focus on that relationship with you. Show us how we can have a more intimate relationship with you. Pour into our hearts. Come dwell with inside of us. And help us to yearn to know you more. To spend time with you. Because you first loved us, we have the opportunity to love you back. And by loving you, we're going to get everything else that we're fighting for now. In your name, amen.